Hey, welcome to Maine Pod Girl. This is a podcast made by pop heads for pop heads. Every episode, y'all can check in with us while we discuss your burning questions as well as what's happening in pop music. Throughout this series, we'll be chiming in on our favorite recent discussion threads and diving into the latest pop emergencies. What's up? I'm a pop rock artist and songwriter. My presence sweet and my aura bright, and it's time to focus on me. AJ Marks. I don't really know if that made sense as an intro. My name is AJ. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm an all-pop R&B artist, songwriter, and unlike Ariana, I am in fact a blow-up doll, a free-for-all solo. <laughs> what song is that from? Jason's song? Oh, yeah. Well, our friend today, our guest today, our guest today is a friend of the pod and former guest of ours. He's a sound engineer and YouTuber accumulating millions of streams by dissecting the discographies of fan favorites like Taylor Swift, Daft Punk, and King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Is that is that how you say that it? That is how you say it. Yes. Okay, good. I just want to make sure I didn't get it all mixed around. He's a pop head's favorite and a personal favorite. You know that he's greedy for love. Welcome back, Mike the Snare. Hello, hello. Woo! Thank you for having me. I, I'm always happy to come on board. I guess you could say I love love the way it makes me feel. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, this episode's about Ariana Grande from yours truly to positions. This idea kind of started because you gave us a bunch of things you wanted to cover last time when we did our 2000s episode. That's right. And I remember one of them being Greedy by Ariana Grande, just like that song on its own. And I was like, you know what? Let's do an Ariana episode. Let's start off with an icebreaker. What's everyone listening to? AJ. You showed me an artist that I had seen around on Spotify. I hadn't really given her a chance yet. And you said, do yourself a favor, go listen to Cupcake. So I went oh, and I man. listened to Cupcake. <laughs> and... <laughs> yes, girl! I am so here for her. Your dick's smaller than my toes. I'd rather have Squidward nose or whatever it is. <laughs> As soon as I heard that, I was like, yes. Wait, is that from the uh, 3435 remix? <laughs> it might as well be. <laughs> she would fit. I, I would love to see that. I've been listening to a lot of 2000s music, like the year 2000. So NSYNC, Brandy, Avril, Britney. And then also the new Doja cover that just came out. Doja doing oh, a rock song. yeah. For that Super Bowl so commercial, right? So into that. So into that. Hell yeah. I have... For context, the past two Fridays have been just, like, the most packed when it comes to, like, new music and, like, the alt-rock sphere. And two days ago, uh, the new Spoon record and the new Big Thief record came out. Um, for context, Spoon is my all-time favorite band, and that record has been on repeat for me pretty much for the past 48 hours. And then I've been breaking it up with listens of the new Big Thief, which is, I I think it was uh, Chris DeVille from Stereo Gum who said it's basically their version of a, the 1975 album. Because it's basically just like their essence, but just like sprawled out so much. Wait, which 1975 album? I believe Notes on a Conditional Form. It's so good. It's such a good album. So together with Big Thief and Spoon, you've been having a Big Spoon kind of weekend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Well done. Hey, I mean, it's it's snowing here in New England. It's like, it's the perfect time for a Big Spoon weekend. Big Spoon weekend. I love it. <laughs> Before we get to yours truly, let's start with kind of like the prologue coming from like 2007 to 2011, 2012. Like, what was she doing leading up to put your hearts up? <laughs> I, I couldn't even say it with a straight face. Started off in Broadway, right? She Yeah, she started off like doing things in like local children's theaters and she performed on a cruise ship. And I think Gloria Estefan like came up to her on a cruise ship after she performed and was like, hey, you did a really good job. Oh, that sounds right. That sounds like a good combo. That would be like older figure meeting younger figure and being like, hey, I, I like what you got, kid. That makes sense in my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so canonically, Gloria Estefan walked up to Ariana Grande and said, I like what you got, kid. And then Ariana had, like, managers and stuff, like, team out in L.A. since she was, like, 14. And she was like, I want to make an R&B album. And they're like, huh, that's cute. She eventually landed a role in 13, the musical. 
so I was like familiar with who Ariana Grande was way back in like, I don't know what year was this like 2008. So she was just like a background character, but there are only 13 characters, but she was also the understudy to the female lead. She joined the cast of Victorious in 2009. Yeah. When did you guys first learn about Ariana Grande? I'm curious. I want to say it was the way. I want to say, like, the music video for The Way was the first time, but I feel like there's got to be some point when I was, like, a kid watching, like, Nickelodeon commercials and I saw, like, Victorious ads and I saw, you know, what she looked like in that show and I was like, ah, okay, cool. But I think, like, the moment where I was like, oh, I know who Ariana Grande is, I can make the connection, was that song. Okay. That's very fitting. Very fitting. Debut single. What about you, Sola? For me, um, I knew about Victorious as a show. I was, um, I had like just started high school, I think when it came out. So I didn't watch it, but I was aware having seen like advertisements for it and a similar thing to you. I remember seeing the red hair and I remember hearing her speaking voice. Yeah, it was, it was kind of weird. It was like very like pillowy and fluffy and it's it's like head voice almost leaning on falsetto like i could almost imagine just like a little bit going up and then she's just like doing it as parody but it's like right on the edge of parody maybe it was like wait this this might be some like galaxy brain move right here but i think maybe it was in part for branding and for remembering her and i think that that's something that kind of like, I mean, we're going to see that later on with, like, some of our other vocal mannerisms. Maybe this was the beginning of that. Mm. I kind of, like, knew of Ariana very distantly from the 13 stuff, but then I kind of, like, knew about her because I actually watched Victorious, I think, for the first maybe two and a half seasons or something like that. There were only three seasons, so I don't know how much of it I've seen, but I know I haven't seen everything. Oh, I didn't realize it was only three seasons. <laughs> well, there was a spinoff too, wasn't there? Yeah, there was Sam and Cat. Yeah, that one. So her first album was like still when she was on Nickelodeon, which is kind of weird to think about, but I guess we'll be saying the same thing about Olivia Rodrigo too, so. Mm. But like the reason I became a fan of hers was because I really liked her on the show. She was my favorite person on the show. And I remember actually, I think I flexed this maybe once or twice before on the podcast, but I told my dad, I said, she's going to be a household name one day. You pay attention to Ariana Grande. And I was thinking kind of like as like a, like a Judy Garland type figure or like a Lucille Ball kind of thing. Like I thought she was going to be a sitcom actress. And then I remember I sought out like her YouTube videos and that's like my entry point into like being a fan of hers. She did like Emotions by Mariah Carey, Grenade, she did Take Care, Rolling in the Deep and she would play a lot with vocoder as well which I always thought was really interesting um but like some of these covers were Mm -hmm. literally just like her in front of a computer singing at acapella like I think rolling in the deep she was just singing into her computer and it was like terrible quality but yeah so that got her signed to Republic Records it wasn't her acting at all which I thought was weird because I only learned that today that like I always thought it was because oh she's on Victorious let's make her a Miley Cyrus or whatever and I'm sure that helped but I didn't realize that it was because someone found her on her YouTube channel, Oh Snap It's Ari, and was like, oh, maybe I should, like, send this to the CEO of Republic. Huh. And that brings us to Yours Truly, her first album. Let's talk very briefly about Put Your Hearts Up, which was the lead single off of Yours Truly. It was supposed to be. It wasn't on the album. It came out, it was supposed to be the lead off of her debut, and then they scrapped it because she fucking hated it um there's a quote where she said that was the worst moment of my life for the video they gave me a bad spray tan which they did can confirm uh, and put me in a princess dress and had me frolic around the street the whole thing was straight out of hell i still have nightmares about it (laughs) i mean you know i bet she looks back on it fondly now in some ways because like she can be the person that she wants to be now but at the time it was very much like oh shit, I'm still Cat from Victorious and I need to like keep these fans that I've made through this children's show, essentially, um, into my music career. Yeah, she had red hair in it too. Yeah, exactly. And let me just uh, read a sampling of these lyrics for those who are not familiar with the song. So this is from the second verse. Wishing on a shooting star in the sky, we can do anything if we try. Can't resurrect Gandhi. Nope. (laughs) <laughs> can't resurrect <laughs> I'm glad she made that clear 
give a wink, give a kiss, give a little happiness. Beautiful. Wow. A plus. World peace. There was one other thing about Put Your Hearts Up. It uses the melody from What's Up by Four Non Blondes, right? Yes. It does the, hey, hey. Some Linda Perry shit. <laughs> I was like, I, I would like, sh- like leaned back in my seat, like, whole, oh my God, what the hell is this? Are you reading? That was like <laughs> bizarre. That was so bizarre. <laughs> and if you were ever curious how misguided this first album was, um, one of the scrapped songs from the album was a collaboration uh, with Sky Blue, who, if you don't know, who that is uh he was one half of lmfao and he was supposed to be on a duet with ariana grande and i just (laughs) cannot imagine that album now and i think they also reached out to iggy azalea too but she like turned them down she was like nah i have a feeling that this first album really just it went through probably a lot of different versions i think they scrapped a whole version of the album that was supposed to be like put your hearts up thank god um i know it is a bop but you're you're my only shoddy with ayaz was um scrapped and given to demi lovato which i don't know i've heard the demo with ariana grande singing it and i kind of like it but i think if she put that out instead of put your hearts up that would have been a much more respectable debut i don't know if anyone sees put your hearts up as ari's debut just because the way really sort of stomped all over it yeah it's like the people who say that's her debut are the people who are at a slumber party and then it gets past midnight it's like guys it's tomorrow morning now it's like yeah you're right if you say puts your heart up is her debut but it's like okay get the hell out of here with your facts and your all that stuff like come on i do have to say though i saw ariana grande perform when she was quote unquote headlining with the wanted and yours truly was dropping like a month later you could spot basically every single ariana fan because of the sheer amount of red wigs oh no ariana came out with like i don't know seven backing dancers or something did one song just did the way and then was like okay bye everyone thanks so much and then left Ari did one song when she was co-headlining with the wanted for this gig and you could hear like an audible like huh she should have at least done (laughs) almost as never enough and literally nathan sykes was there oh yeah i didn't even think about that you would think yeah with almost as never enough all i hear every time i listen to it is the terrible comping job the vocal comps in that song because there are so many clips where she's like in the middle of a word and it'll just cut out as soon as you notice you'll never be able to unhear it so just don't listen out for it because it ruins the song (laughs) that was actually three minute song or something right and then it was like drawn out for an extra two minutes for the album version how dare you say drawn out it was on the mortal instrument soundtrack (laughs) oh my god i'm just gonna say for everyone listening right now i am a fan of ariana grande she's one of my most i think she is my most listened to artist maybe of all time but i'm gonna i'm gonna rake this this album over the coals have you heard better left unsaid yeah the song where it's like really nice and then it's like Put your hands up. And then it like becomes uh, like an EDM banger and the it like has a drop. Yeah. It is terrible. And it's like the closer too, right? Like that's the last impression of the album, isn't it? Yeah, it's so awful. I also think another highlight of this album is like Honeymoon Avenue. Oh girl. Which was girl. one of the two songs written with Victoria Monet and Tommy Brown, who became really instrumental to her career going forward. Until I think Thank You Next, I think they just round out all of her like album cuts for a couple albums because I think all the singles were always like Max Martin songs and all the album cuts were always like Victoria and Tommy. Honeymoon Avenue is good. The two that come to mind, aside from the way the first one's popular song, was it Mika, (laughs) I think? And it's funny because that one is kind of in the same vein as Put Your... uh, I, I'm already spacing out the name of the song. Put is, your hearts up. Put your hearts up. I was thinking feelings for a second. I was like, how do you just do that? You can remember it because the song is an instruction to make a heart shape with your hands and put it in the air. Oh. That's oh. why she does that in the video like the whole time. <laughs> that definitely did not just click for me just now. Because popular song also interpolates popular from wicked yeah and for some reason i feel like that should come off even cheesier than the the four non-blondes 
sample or whatever, but I think it actually works really well. I'm also just like a sucker for Mika too. Like, I feel like he's one of those like perpetually underrated. He reminds me of um, uh, Marianas Trench in that they're like both artists who like, if you're in the know of pop music, you know, and you respect a good deal because they're good. But for whatever reason, you just don't really hear much about them in like the, the mainstream or whatever. Marianas Trench is banger after banger. Banger after banger. That discography is beautiful yeah i'm glad that you hold that opinion about popular song i actually even more so than better left unsaid cannot listen to that song really i just i liked it a lot when it first came out but i've like grown out of it just because i don't know because i heard it when i was a kid i kind of just like associate it with child stuff it is a very childish oh yeah like because it's like there are lines about like the girl who's mean to them being like oh, you shoved my head in the toilet and now you're the one who's cleaning them it's like yeah it just it's looking back on it now it's like like the hook is good and the production is for the time period it was good but it's also just like it feels so juvenile now yeah exactly and and also doesn't she shove someone's head in the toilet in the thank you next video i mean probably not but she shoves someone in a locker i think Oh, yeah, because they're referencing, like, one of, like, Mean Girls or something, or... The bullification of Ariana Grande. <laughs> Die a hero or live long enough, so on and so forth. A song, though, off of the album that I, like, can't listen to is Piano. I was... That was the other one I was gonna mention, because I don't care for it at all. I really don't. I mean, she was, like, what, 19 when she was making this album? I believe that she probably thought it was a good idea to be, like, I don't need to make radio bangers. I can just, like, play a song on my piano man like <laughs> oh, let me do me let me be myself yeah this album as a whole i think about this album and i think about the inclusion of better left unsaid and i would probably have such a different opinion if that wasn't on the album it's like an r&b retro sound that brings together like 60s doo-wop 90s hip-hop and like that one edm break and it just <laughs> sours me on the album i just wanted to touch a little bit on the cultural context because even you know with all of our critiques and um opinions about this album yours truly made ariana grande the 15th female artist ever to debut at number one in the u.s with their debut album hell yeah the way even debuted in the top 10 which is crazy yeah so you know she came in swinging and obviously her connection with nickelodeon would have helped that but there's a lot of music on here that you can still jam to this album overall like the production's kind of dated it's a little too closely tied to her influences but I do love this album. But going into her second album, My Everything, so this was like a really quick turnaround. Problem, which was the lead single, came eight months after she dropped Yours Truly. So she like barely had any promo time for her first album. Classic Ari. So she like kind of just had like a quick turnaround. Her thing, instead of like red hair, became cat ears. So I remember I went to her, her show in 2015 and everyone was wearing cat ears. Instead of, like, having lighters at the show, she'd have cat ears that light up at a certain moment. Like, they were, like, remote-controlled, I guess, or something. Or I guess you could turn them on, maybe. And whereas, like, the instrumentation for her last album was cello players, violin players, trombone, trumpet, viola, guitar, saxophone. This was, like, pretty much an all-programmed album. I feel like I associate these albums pretty closely together because they share a lot of the same elements, I think. But it just kind of faded out a lot of that, like honeymoon avenue kind of stuff yeah that the, the overall sound is like less dated and it's funny too because you know the next album will have edm influences still but i think it's a matter of the collaborators that she had on like zed mm -hmm. it doesn't sound as dated as better left unsaid did yeah i don't think anything sounds mishmashed to me this album actually has no skips and i know that's kind of i don't know maybe an unpopular opinion because i know a lot of people don't like hands on me but uh what what songs stuck out to you guys on this intro yes i <laughs> love intro she's the best at intros it's funny too because my first time hearing it wasn't even on the album the first time i ever heard it was with a mashup that i found on youtube of that beyonce's blow and childish gambino's heartbeat and it is such a good mashup to any listeners who are interested. I think it's uh, DJ Drybones who made it. Highly recommend checking it out. Um, yeah, intro is a phenomenal track. It's just a perfect way to introduce the album. 
and I wish it was its own full song to some extent, or if it was like to bring in Coldplay of all people, like they did Life in Technicolor as the opening to Viva La Vida, but then they also did like Life in Technicolor 2, which is like that song, but as a full song. A part of me wishes that it was a full song in some capacity, but yeah, it's just lovely. It like brings you into the album's world so well. I love the vocal harmonies on it too, because there's like a weird bit, I think, with one point in like the first verse, there's like some interesting like interval playing that she does like with different different harmonies and it's it's really fascinating for an intro track especially since it's only you know her second album yeah i i love that song really love that song to me it kind of established that she was like people are like albums artists people are singles artists i think she's like an intro artist (laughs) she always has like a really good (laughs) intro right with yours truly it was honeymoon avenue yeah perfect way to open the album she had an intro for this album she had an intro called intro for christmas and chill Mm -hmm. which also slaps dangerous woman was moonlight sweetener was raindrops which was like an acapella intro yeah Mm -hmm. i think her acapella intros are just great yeah. It's just great. Oh, then Positions was Shut Up. Mm. I think Imagine was the intro for Thank You Next. But I, that's the only one where I'm kind of like, I don't know if I buy it as an intro, but she's usually really, really consistent with intros. You asked what songs stuck out. I mean, I think that there's so many Problem with Iggy, One Last Time, Break Free. I like Best Mistake with Big Sean. I think that's kind of her thank you next before thank you next, you know? And then Bang Bang. I know she hates Bang Bang, but it's like a fucking modern Lady Marmalade. You know what I'm saying? Has she mentioned why she hates it? That surprises me. She doesn't want to perform it at all. I think it's because it's like compromise pop. She wanted to do R&B. She was like being even more pigeonholed into like doing pop. So they brought in Zed, you know, gave her a problem. And they said, oh, you're going to do this song with Jesse J and Nicki Minaj. Even though obviously she loves working with Nicki Minaj. This album was kind of like half things that she wanted to do. And then like half things that she was like, yeah, I guess we could throw that on the album. So it's popular. This album to me was mostly just like her compromise album. Although I do feel like there's much more of a prominent R&B influence in this album than on her previous album. Yeah. But none of them are like notable or stand out to me or whatever, except for the singles. And the singles only stand out to me because they were big songs, if that makes sense. Yeah, they were everywhere. Every Sephora was playing every single, every single one of these songs. John Caramonica <laughs> mentioned, I'm pretty sure, on the New York Times podcast, she would have the weekend on a song about BDSM and he would be singing all the like more explicit stuff and she would let him be a little bit more explicit about what the song was actually about. And I just thought it was like an interesting kind of trade-off. Like it was obviously she wanted to go into like mature themes, but she had no explicit songs on the album. She was like leaving all that kind of stuff to like Big Sean and... Childish Gambino too. The song that he's on is great too. Yeah, the song with Childish is so good. It's so funny that she has a song to someone she was dating who she realized was gay where she samples I'm coming out oh my god (laughs) also I had no clue Harry Styles wrote a song on this really what was the song that he wrote again just a little bit of your heart it's not very notable outside of the fact that Harry wrote it but I don't think they've even ever performed it together. I know that Harry's performed it on his own tours or whatever, but I would also say like around the time the kind of thought about her was like she's good and she has a like a bunch of good songs but they didn't feel like her songs so like all her biggest hits had like featured collaborations like her sound wasn't very consistent she still had like a lot of mariah comparisons and so i feel like she kind of built the design of her career off of this album but i feel like we'll get to see kind of her identity a little bit more with this album we start to see this pattern of these are the album cuts i'm going to record with tommy victoria and taylor and like these are like the hit songs i'm going to do with max martin and Ilya, etc and like she kind of just always operates out of like those two camps and like maybe has like an additional third camp depending on the album i guess until positions She doesn't try to make something that's just one thing. She tries to take in a bunch of different things. And I think for her first three albums, tries to take an amalgamation of like all these different sounds and like put them together. Like yours truly is clunky and my everything is less clunky, but still isn't like isn't as cohesive, I would say. And then Dangerous Woman, I think, perfects that kind of shit. 
I think that my everything is, I think it's cohesive. The singles, like, in their own unit, I think together, like, are cohesive. Like, if they were to be taken and put into, like, an EP or something, that would be, it would be feel pretty cohesive. Mm-hmm. What I think the full album is, though, is, like, each song has the sound, and that sound is cohesive, but all of the songs feel like they're kept separately apart. It's like, this might be a pretentious way of putting it, but it's like, it is an album in the sense that it is a collection of songs but it's not an album it's not like a full musical statement yet yet and we'll get there yeah okay so in 2013 after she released yours truly she released a 2013 ep called christmas kisses which mm, <laughs> is just not great yeah, that title. so it's <laughs> It was like half originals, half covers. She wrote a song with one of her Victorious co-stars. She did a cover with another one of her Victorious co-stars. It was very much like still in that kind of realm. And then her second attempt at Christmas music was doing Santa Tell Me. It was not its own EP. It was just a song in 2014. That might be her most successful Christmas attempt. It is a solid Christmas song. It is a great Christmas song. song. But she hadn't at this point like kind of shown us a project with a through line that kind of showed who she was as an artist and did things that only she could do. But that takes me to Christmas and Chill in 2015. Her best Christmas songs, I think, are all the songs on this album. It's true. And it's her favorite body of work. Really? Huh. I mean, we finally get like pure R and B Ari in some ways. Yeah, it's like a like a trap Christmas album. It's great. <laughs> I don't really do Christmas music uh, that much anymore. I'm not like that big on Christmas music, but Christmas and Chill is a really Christmas and Chill can get solid. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Get the bag. <laughs> It was weird to me at first that this would be the instance where she goes fully into the more trap and R&B side of things. Then again, I can also imagine this was low enough of stakes where she could do that. And if it wasn't that good or if they didn't really care for it, to be like, okay, we did it. Toss that aside. Do something else. Mm-hmm. To be honest, though, the only song that stuck out to me really was the the closer um, it's cause that's the one with the ukulele, right? Yeah. That's the non trap song, yeah. <laughs> which is like, it's just super, it sticks out like a sore thumb on the record. It's like this EP's better left unsaid, except like the complete opposite in production. But here's the thing. I'm not a huge, and this is weird. Cause I play ukulele. Like it is one of my like primary instruments, something about this. I don't know, man. There's, it's a very much 50, 50 with me when it comes to ukulele songs. And this one just didn't click for me. Ah, uh, so no winter things cover on YouTube. No, by Mike no. The Snare. Unfortunately. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. I'm sure people would have loved to see that though. <laughs> see, I just, I really like this EP cause it has like interesting chord structures. And I think as a fan of Ariana, that was like the first instance of like her kind of going in this direction. I feel like it was just like an insight into like, oh, this is what she can do. And like, oh, like this is what she's capable of and what we might hear more of. And this is like in 2015 before almost any other pop artists embraced trap music because it was just starting to become like a cultural phenomenon in 2015. Talk about her being early to the party with short songs because the songs on this EP are like, what, two minutes long? (laughs) Yeah, they're tiny. They were way ahead of their time. Yeah. to say. Yeah, and then they slapped the end <laughs> they slapped it's just really funny that this was like i think a big turning point in her career and it's also something that if you could blink and miss it like a lot of people don't even know that it exists she jumps shit from like the good girl image like she's talking about being horny and having sex all the time like 34 35 much now let's jump to 2016 with the princess bunny herself making her debut we got Dangerous Woman. So was Focus uh, the single leading up to this, but it never actually made it onto the album? It was like the put your hearts up of Dangerous Woman. So mm-hmm. she right, released okay. it. And I mean, everyone hated it, I guess, except for me. I didn't hate it either. Oh, nice. Y'all are, okay. y'all are on your own. Except for us, I guess. It's problem 2.0, but like not as good. I disagree. But anyway, so I think we need some like context of what was happening at the time. I think it's really funny that she licked a donut and that somehow changed 
the entire public perception of her at the time because right because she didn't have any scandals at the moment um like up until then like she wasn't as much of a public figure like she just had a bunch of hit songs people knew about if she never dropped anything notable after that she probably just like people wouldn't remember her that well except for her songs so are you talking about the viral security camera footage? footage of her licking a donut and then saying i hate america what she was saying in context she was like god i hate the fact that everything on this menu at this i guess donut shop is so sugary it doesn't make the most sense right and i think she was like she was with her boyfriend and i think she was like being dared to lick the donut or whatever it somehow like upended her goodwill with the gp with the general public i think she was like a pretty pop singer so it it was like really easy to say, oh, you know, she has a great voice and she's pretty. So she's probably like a total diva. And I think there were a lot of news stories after that where there were like she yelled at a photographer to only film her from one side of her face or something like that. Did she? No, I don't think so. But I think everything just like got Uh-oh. way out of hand and all the tabloids wanted to cast her as like some sort of diva and some sort of problem child. Full disclosure, I did not know about that donut looking video until just now. Wow. Oh, interesting thing it was like such a big thing that like the white house uninvited her to perform at one of the ceremonies and, yeah and then miley cyrus parodied it on snl and then ariana grande hosted snl and she made fun of how non-scandal worthy it was she was like yeah you know these child stars like some do drugs some go to jail and i uh, some lick donuts you know it's it's problematic anyway i just thought i would have to say that because that also might have contributed to focus flopping because no one liked her at the moment. Everyone saw it as like a copy and paste of problem. Mm-hmm. I mean, and this is just me. I think it's much better than problem. I think problems really dated. I think this song is just really fun. And I love when she says, let's go girls. <laughs> <laughs> one of her best music videos even though it's just product placement yeah those horns do sound sick though oh they're so good it's so much better than problem with the stupid little sax anyway i just think that the melodies in problem are better than in focus but i do agree that the production of focus is better i also just think it's funny that jamie fox does this is like not his first but his second time doing a james brown impression oh yeah yeah because the first one was what was it gold digger yeah that would have been it yeah so they were just like let's get jamie fox on this song so jamie fox is uncredited on this one and big sean was the guy who was whispering like one less problem without you and he was uncredited on problem oh that's right yeah he's in the music video too right yeah or like you see just like the close-up of his mouth it copies and pastes it down to having an uncredited male vocalist in the chorus as well <laughs> but the live performance at the 2015 amas the best moment of her career the best moment. It's Broadway, it's camp, it's classy, it's awesome. How dare you? Best moment of her career. <laughs> best moment of her career. Clearly it was putting your hearts up. <laughs> and leading into Dangerous Woman does have, you know, okay, even though it has almost a billion streams, one of her most underrated songs, which is Into You. Is that almost a billion? It is that almost a, wow. a hot billy. Oh, wow. That's crazy. It is kind of. Because Side to Side was the bigger song off of the album. Yeah, even Dangerous Woman, I think, too. Like, or at least Dangerous Woman felt bigger. Yeah. Like, it may not have been numerically, but it like it just felt... Felt bigger, it charted higher. Yeah. It has less streams than Into You. What? But I, I, that's, that's probably now, because, like, Ari fans... Into You is seen as, like, the epitome of a pop song. Yeah. And, like, one of the best, if not the best song in her career. Which, I gotta say, is just not putting respect on Greedy's name. Because Greedy is so much better. Mm, and I think Greedy is Ariana's best song. It is. As of this recording. One of the most expertly crafted in terms of production. You know what it reminds me of, too? Because we're talking about Focus, too. And Greedy feels like a response to Focus not doing well. Because it's just like, okay, yeah, let's just bring in even more horns. Let's just blow this up even further. <laughs> and yeah, then you all can like try and laugh at me, but you can't because I just made the best song of my career. Yeah. It also, speaking <laughs> of intros, like we were talking about earlier, like that opening of like the great I know that you, yeah. Literally, my first listen, it's like, it's almost like the same thing as Put Your Hearts Up, where it's like, I felt like myself flying back in my seat, but in a completely different, in like a good way this time. In a good way this time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the same thing happened to me because she 
posted the first five seconds of it on Instagram, like I think a week before the album came out. And I remember playing that, I think like a hundred times, like just sitting there listening to her Instagram, listening to the same five seconds on repeat. It's just the greedy, you know that I'm greedy for love. Greedy, you know that I'm greedy for... And I just was like, all right, I, I can't get enough of this. And then, oh my God, how could I... The, the key change. The key change. It's change. One of the most well-placed key changes I've ever heard in my life. Like, I, I don't know if this is this in and of itself is a hot take, but it's like, there are some songs that try to do key changes that don't need them or don't warrant them. Like, yes. um, I, I think one of them that happened recently was a BTS is dynamite and no shade to BTS. I, I, I like them. Like, I think they're talented, but it's like in that particular song. And I like dynamite too, up until that point, but it was like, I heard that for the first time and I'm like, you didn't need to do this. This just, just felt you, you, you had me. And then you tried to go a bit further and I was like, eh, okay, cool. Whatever. Um, greedy's key change phenomenal absolutely warranted and it is just like because by that time like i'm just dancing in my chair listening and it's like that extra thing that pushes me over the edge to be like oh my god this is a phenomenal song and it shows off her vocals so she well. sings so well on it yeah you know actually i take it back into you is not the underrated song it's greedy exactly it's greedy, greedy is what everyone <laughs> thinks into you is let's be real <laughs> <laughs> It's those harmonies, the delivery, yeah. it, it everything. Smacks you everything in the is face. so good. It just it, and it's so good. Yeah. Mm. As an artist, it's it's interesting to see her progression as well because this is her third album. But on this album, she co-wrote ten songs, which is more than her last two albums combined. And on this one, we really start to see, I'd say, like the real Ariana coming out. This is kind of funny. She apparently invited herself over for dinner to Imogen Heap's house for her 21st birthday when she was making Dangerous Woman. And she told Imogen, she's like, one day, probably my fourth record, I'm going to have fun and totally be myself. I'm going to be really true to myself, which is interesting that like even during Dangerous Woman, she kind of I mean, I don't know how she felt by the end of the process of making it, but like during it, it kind of is interesting and telling that she still i guess wasn't comfortable enough to like be like this is everything that i want to be and again that's probably just the inclusion of how many pop songs are on there it was like the most musically diverse album in her discography you know she goes into pop and house and disco and reggae and r&b and trap and there's a quote from guest of the pod and friend of the pod nolan feeney who wrote the review for dangerous woman um for entertainment weekly and he sums it up perfectly. Uh, I'll just read off what he said. Complaints about a personality deficiency have also been lobbed at Grande's music. My Everything suffered from trying to be everything, and it touched on so many styles that she appeared to have no point of view. Here, the singer proves these haters wrong. With a streamlined team of hitmakers such as Max Martin, she pulls off pop, R&B, reggae, and house, all without overextending herself or pandering to trends. Yeah. Mm. Mic drop, Nolan. <laughs> That's exactly how I feel. Like She tried it once. She tried it again and it was better and then she tried it this time and it's like that's kind of the album that she was trying to make from the beginning truly coming to her own yeah i just want to highlight um two underrated tracks uh be all right and let me love you i think the one with uh, lil wayne yeah i the production on both of them i think is excellent Production on Be All Right is great. Let Me Love You is like very understated. And I like the how the chorus is like her doing the processed like vocal jumps where it's not her doing like the enunciation of the let me la, uh, uh, uh. It's like it's very clearly computerized, but it kind of works with the sort of like electro R&B feel that the rest of the track has. And I think that's a neat production touch. Like this album was the one for me that made me think, oh shit, like she's here to stay. Which I found interesting just because I feel like overall, like the general public kind of had like an opposite effect. Whereas when she released this album, she was struggling with focus, even though focus debuted in the top 10, but then it like, I guess sunk like a stone, yeah. but she was struggling with focus. She was struggling with the donut thing. I should say it's not about the donut. It was about her saying, I hate America. Everyone just remembers it as the donut thing. Then she released this album and it missed the number one spot because of Drake. I think it's her only album to ever do that. In the U.S. at least. In the U.S., yeah. And I think for a while, like Dangerous Woman, I think peaked at like number eight or number six or something. And then Into You missed the top ten 
and then they really like didn't know where to go with the album and like for a while they didn't have like a good single release and then what saved it actually was side to side weirdly enough because that song ended up blowing up and i think she was starting to promote it in like august and i don't think it like became big until like december but i think that was the big hit from this album it was at that time when the sort of anti-chorus was coming into the mainstream. <laughs> it was one of the songs that does the anti-chorus sort of thing where the other bits of the song are bigger than the chorus in terms of production and everything else for side to side. And right? That was 2016. That was that time, yeah. right? Yeah. Everyone who made pop music had to rethink how they made pop music. Yeah. Like that was the year of work. I want to say the Justin Bieber singles from 2015 were still popular. It was at that point where it was like, because 2017, I think, was the year, like, that was Despacito, and that was the year where I think pop music had fully transitioned from what it was in the earlier part of the decade to what it actually would become by the end. Side to Side is kind of interesting in that respect, because it's not like an Into You, it's not a even a Dangerous Woman, really, where it has that kind of dynamic contrast to it. For the most part, it mm. stays relatively in the same kind of dynamic lane you're right everything did i feel change in 2017 sonically and that's when mm. the old way of pop was kind of thrown out and everyone was trying to figure out new ways to go into pop music then we got stuff like reputation witness oh god <laughs> Rainbow, yeah. so many like career pivots happen. Or Joanne, mm. oh no, that was 2016, but that was still after Dangerous Woman. So there were so many like career pivots right around that time, and you know, and then you had like Beyonce and Rihanna abandoning traditional pop music. It was just different from 2017 onwards, and and no music was ever released ever again after 2016. <laughs> <laughs> I guess my point is that when Sweetener came around, the whole landscape had changed. And so going and doing the same old, same old was kind of not an option anymore. She didn't have a quick turnaround after this album compared to her other albums where she was releasing literally every single year. With Sweetener, she finished the album in 2016. And it was, like I assume, mostly handled by Pharrell, because that's who she was working with at the time. And then she wasn't going to release it while she was on tour. So she was touring, and then the Manchester Arena bombing happened. And obviously the tour ended because of that. And it was such a big thing that I, there was no way whatever she recorded could have worked, I guess, for whatever she was going to release. And so she reworked the album... And we got Sweetener. It's very down the middle between the Pharrell half and the Max half. And then there's also like a Tommy Brown third that no one talks about, which is like Good Night and Go and Pete Davidson and all those other extra songs sprinkled in at the end. I think this album's like perfect for this point in her career, because at this point, if she had continued on the like Dangerous Woman track, it, you know, the EDM pop would have seemed pretty disingenuous and like a sad album would be a lot and kind of like very eerie to hear at this point. And like, I just feel like there are a lot of unexpected sounds and choices and it, and for the first time in her Ooh. career, it doesn't rely on any of its features. Like all of the features, like Nikki, Missy, and Pharrell, none of them are the most notable part of the song and the lyrics address the tragedy and address positivity and address like the outcome of it without being solely around it and so i think it was like a a plus reaction to it it just feels so real like breathing no tears left to cry get well soon she just gave us amazing response to to tragedy in this album and i just think it's incredible from start to finish i don't know how true this is but i remember coming back to the u.s and talking to my friends about god as a woman and how much i fucked with that song and they were like oh yeah you know it's like having a hard time being played on radio here and i was like what why and they're saying like it's blasphemous to hardcore christians that god is a woman and so it's been upsetting people so a lot of radio stations won't play it i was also i'm trying to remember and this might either be something that is confirmed or someone just noticed a similarity the uh, the guitar part in it is either heavily inspired or is from a pink floyd song which I think is super, super neat. No 
way uh, yes actually the this is where i noticed it from it's from uh friends of the pod switched on pop and they did a comparison between god is a woman and pink floyd's pigs three different ones um it's not like a one-to-one sort of thing what? but it is it is very much similar a uh, similar enough to be like huh i wonder if that was intentional I, if it is that would be so cool that'd be the coolest thing I wonder if that was Max Martin. I feel like, I don't know why, but Max Martin gives me the vibes that he would be a Pink Floyd fan. Oh, I mean, he's a metalhead, isn't he? Like, he started out in metal bands. Yeah, yeah I could totally see that. I mean, he's, he's Swedish. Swedish. He has no choice. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> a lot of songs, like The Light Is Coming and stuff, are like very much about positivity and you know you mentioned be all right earlier it kind of seemed like a lyrical theme that she was going for like put your hearts up include positivity sorry i don't mean to bring that up again resurrect gandhi, <laughs> resurrect gandhi exactly why wasn't that in god is a woman gandhi is a woman gandhi's a woman oh you believe gandhi's a woman <laughs> what <laughs> there's a part at the end right there's like 40 seconds of silence at the end every time i listen to the album i forget that the silence is there and so if i have something cued afterwards i'm like why is nothing playing but it reminds me though because the silence is there to honor the people who lost their lives at the manchester arena so it like takes the runtime of get well soon which is the song it's on to 522 which is the date of the attack it's such an effective moment of silence at the end of the album because it makes me think about the attack every time i listen to the album yeah which i guess is kind of heavy but i just thought i would throw that in there i thought i thought it was this this album is very well balanced where it's like it's like a boppy fun album about being in love but also like processing trauma yeah i think maybe for us aj because we were living in the north of england at the time and i knew people at that concert thankfully they all survived but like i think that this album hit me particularly hard because of her effort to honor those who had passed and those who had been injured and those who had been affected including herself i think that it was just so well-rounded of a piece for that purpose and also now that i live in manchester like people adore ariana grande here and i think a lot of it has to do with sweetener as a response and also her benefit concert right yeah again this is so weird that like a response to a terrorist attack is giving her back all the goodwill that, like, the donut stole from her. <laughs> the light is coming to take back everything the donut stole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just feels like a weird Mad Libs. Pete Davidson being on this album as well as a, as a track. Yes, the best song on the album. No, but I think she was leaning into, again, sort of like, well, you know, everybody already knows everything about my personal life, so I might as well name a song that doesn't mention pete by name but make the song <laughs> called pete davidson yeah that was fucking hilarious she has such a good sense of humor with that shit in terms of growth here it's like we were talking about how much she was writing on the previous albums she wrote every song on this album she co-wrote every song except for the intro which is just a cover what's it a cover of oh it's a cover of frankie valley in the four seasons oh cool i didn't know that and it's called an angel cried i think yeah, it's pretty it's like an interesting pick, right? Yeah. For this album, it felt like she was really an albums artist. Like this is one where it didn't feel like she had the singles and then the songs that weren't good enough to be singles. It felt like there were a lot of songs on here that were deliberately album tracks and not because they weren't good enough, but that because they were meant to be album tracks. Shout out to literally all the Pharrell songs yeah. on this album. Yeah. It felt like she had a very clear vision of what she wanted this to be. And... All her previous album covers were in black and white, and then this one was in color, because she said, for the first time, my life is in color as well. Aww. Aww, baby. I know. Very cute. <laughs> and it was her best received album at that point. I just want to make one point, um, and it is the point that I love to make whenever this album comes up. Um, you guys know the song Successful. Yes. Oh, sorry. That's the best song on this it, album. It's a very good song, but a big reason why I enjoy it so much is that the, the synth hook that goes like, bah, 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 sounds like Animal Crossing. It yes. sounds like the little thing that you, when you go up to a villager and it plays the little town jingle, sounds exactly like that. 
And I love that so much. And I'm gonna assume it's on purpose. I would hope so. Yeah, I would not be surprised. Just like her whole like bop it reference, you know? She she just loves games. I don't think that she was actually trying to reference Bop It. I thought that was unfortunate. <laughs> Bitch, she definitely was. There's no way. There's no way that a '90s BB like her was not referencing Bop It. <laughs> that song. That is a skip for me. I'm sorry, Ari. She gave 90% of the album to Bop It. <laughs> <laughs> gave up 90% for the win. Yeah. Asbro needs the money. <laughs> Whereas Seven Rings is like cold and icy. It's like successful is kind of about the same thing where she's like, isn't it so cute how I'm successful? <laughs> that's, that's a good point you bring up, AJ, because something interesting with successful where there is the line about like, look at me, I'm so successful. But then she at the second half, she's like, and look at you, too. You're also successful. Like there's an interesting dynamic of bringing in the listener. But then Seven Rings, like you said, it's cold and it's more about her own wealth. Seven Rings, I guess, is kind of emblematic of the themes of Thank You Next, I guess, where it just feels like the whole album is like a hardened, skeptical side to Ariana. Even Seven Rings, which is her song about friends, and she described it as a friendship anthem, is like mostly about distracting herself from trauma by indulging in capitalism. Mm. And like Woo! saying, like, I'm just going to like shop instead of, you know, thinking about all the shit that happened. And speaking of the shit that happened, uh, just to preface for anyone who doesn't know, she was in the middle of promoting her third single from Sweetener, Breathe In, when Mac Miller died. And then they stopped all the promo for that song and she made this album essentially in three weeks about processing her grief and that resulting in calling off her engagement with pete davidson she wrote the first nine songs in a week and then over the course of the next two weeks she recorded them which is just outrageous it relates to this kind of quote from her which she says my dream has always been to be obviously not a rapper but to like put out music in a way that a rapper does because she's saying like women have to follow a strict schedule like they gotta tease the song on instagram and they gotta link the pre-save and all this kind of stuff and she's like i don't want to do that i just want to drop music when i have it i relate to that so much i don't want to like promote the music i just want to drop it i just want to make the music that's my job kind of thing yeah, yeah the goal for real. The dream and so this album every song is very skeptical um hardened even the songs that might seem more positive come from a very like jaded angle and i love jaded music however only a few songs really stood out to me on thank you next i think i'm probably like the only human on the planet who doesn't really care for thank you next that much i was still in my like sweetener mode and then this just suddenly dropped and i was like oh okay and i was still processing sweetener processing all all that music i thought that it was cool that she had dropped something but also like being a music artist i was like fuck are we gonna have to all start dropping shit like and the answer was mm. yes <laughs> yes <laughs> daniel x said it himself the money for that. God. it is it is kind of wild though because i remember she surprise dropped thank you next the song in november sweetener was late august maybe it was just wild. I was like, wow, we really had like two months to process this album before starting a new one. I don't know. How did you how did you guys feel about that? How did you feel about it? As someone who eats up albums like pretty quickly, I was really enjoying the quick turnaround, especially because they're like her two most critically acclaimed and best remembered albums. And it reminded me of something that she did with her first two albums where they were kind of less than a year apart from each other. I think the close proximity of it was able to keep Ariana on everybody's mind of like, thank you next to the song. And then the album, like a few months later, that said that combined with the severe shift in tone makes it hard for me to separate this from sweetener. Cause they feel very much like two sides or two different perspectives or outlooks on the same kind of trauma or the same kind of traumatic event, And I, I don't know. I guess I kind of value that. I like that she's able to kind of harness both sides of the coin for her art. That said, most of these songs were written in like nine days and like the whole album just kind of came together quickly. There's a yeah. lot of parts on this album where it feels like, oh, this decision feels like this was made because there wasn't that much time to make it or rather they put it out soon after. And to some extent, I kind of like that. And there's a lot of interesting 
experiments on here like um like needy and bad idea are the ones that jump out to me immediately mm. because needy kind of sounds like the sort of sort of like more down tempo cousin of like an rem off sweetener um and then bad idea throws in some of the strings that you know were more prevalent on like yours truly and will come up again like much more on positions Thank you, Next. I don't think any other artist could pull off a song like that nearly as successfully because we all knew, or at least a large portion of the general population knew about Ariana's drama with a lot of these different people. I guess that Taylor Swift was like the only other person who could have done it. But then also she was like a one song, couple of songs per X. Ariana was like, you all get one line in a verse. <laughs> I think what's funny about Thank You Next is like the song title makes sense because it's OK. Thank you. Next boyfriend. But the album title is like it came six months after Sweetener. So it's like, thank you. Next album. <laughs> like I said, with Sweetener, she had like a lot of goodwill with people in that era but then i think with thank you next and with seven rings which came out right before the album it was kind of turning back again even though she gave up 90 percent of royalties to roger and hammerstein she had the copyright discourse of princess nokia and two chains and a couple other artists being like hey i did that exact same song oh, that's right she gave the credit to two chains i guess eventually because he was on the remix of of seven rings and i guess that was their settlement or whatever but then there was also on top of the black fishing stuff Stuff that was going on with some choice frames from the Thank You Next music video. On top of this, like she leaned into it a lot harder with Seven Rings, and obviously it's a lot more hip hop based. And then she had a lot of that with like Japanese culture. And so she like got that, remember, she got that like tattoo on her finger or something that said like barbecue. barbecue. I think it was supposed to say seven rings in Japanese. You're right, you're right. But instead, it said, like, pork barbecue. Yeah, pork barbecue, like that. that's it. And it ended up becoming her most successful song of her career, which is also wild. Because yeah. it's not representative of the rest. It's not nearly as colorful as the rest of her discography in terms of, like, vocal arrangements, lyrics... I could go on. Yeah, it's very much an outlier. Even kind of on Thank You Next, the album, it's kind of an outlier. Except for maybe, like, Break Up With Your Boyfriend. Yeah. There's some similarities there. But, like, the rest of Thank You Next doesn't really sound all that much like Seven Rings. For Bloodline, I do really like the production on it. But the hook of it, the, the Don't Want You In My Bloodline, does irk me the wrong way. Like, it very much feels like it reeks of eugenics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it just very much just like, Ariana, how into, like, that sort of thing are you? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, a sick song otherwise. Like, the production's sick, but just that one part is just, uh, yeah. It's one of those songs that, I don't know, may have changed if it had more than, like, a day to be written. But it is my favorite on the album, so I will just stay quiet. I do think that this album has terrible track listing. I didn't like the album the first couple times I listened to it because of the track listing. And as soon as I reordered it, I was like, this makes so much more sense. I started with Break Up With Your Girlfriend because it fits if you put it with the other kind of like more pop songs. Like it just as a last song, it just kind of doesn't make it any sense. It leaves everything on a very sour mm. mood. Like it's a very like negative way to end an album, especially since Thank You Next is right before it. And like that is a closer. Yes would be yeah. great the closer. yeah thank you next is a perfect like summary of the album it just doesn't make any sense that thank you next wouldn't be last or wouldn't be first yeah the one thing i really did like about the track listing is that needy and nasa are right next to each other because one's about being really needy and like wanting someone near you at all times and the other one's like about i need space you know whatever and talking about conflicting ideas and i always just really love how she put those two together because i think separately i guess they, yeah, they wouldn't they would seem like hypocritical but together right next to each other it kind of seems very intentional and i just i've always appreciated that People are varied. People have diverse feelings on any given day. Like, she's a human being struggling just like the rest of us with emotions and finding herself. Let the girl have space but also be needy, okay? <laughs> <laughs> this whole album is like her magnum opus. 
and it's like by far her most successful album and will probably be the record she's remembered for so it's just kind of funny that it kind of came all together in like three weeks yeah and also the first time that Ari was recognized in the four main categories of the Grammys also her first album with no features oh yeah that's right that's true she's not relying on an Iggy Azalea anymore (laughs) Yeah, so she then released Positions, right? We'll go into the next kind of era. But before we go into that, I just want to say it is weird in some ways that Positions was dropped the normal amount of time after Thank You, Next. Because it was (laughs) the end of 2020. Thank You, Next was the beginning of 2019. It's very typical to, like, wait 18 months for another promo cycle, like, casual year and a half. That's what she did. Except the weird thing about it is that it was perceived as you're oversaturating yourself. And it's just, I guess, because they were technically one calendar year apart. But at least in my opinion, it might be because after Thank You Next dropped, I think two months later, she dropped Monopoly with Victoria Monet. And then like a month or two after that, she had a top 10 hit boyfriend with Social House. And then she had the Charlie's Angels soundtrack in November of 2019. And then she had the K Bye For Now live album in December of 2019. So she had a lot of content at that time. And the live album's most notable for showing how hard she goes on breathing live and how it's so much better than the original. But then in 2020, <laughs> she had Stuck With You her pandemic song went number one, even though it shouldn't have. <laughs> Why would you say something so controversial yet so brave? Yes, I know. Oh, I think it's a good song. Stuck with you sucks. <laughs> anyway, so that went number one. <laughs> Rain on me went number one. Um, her song with Lady Gaga. That's great. Good as hell remix. The Lizzo remix went number three. Okay, but did she need to be on that song? No. Did she contribute to Good As Hell? No, The answer is not. no. If she had gone as vocally hard as Lizzo does on Good As Hell, I think that it would have totally would've been worked. Perfect. But she does, it would've been perfect. But she does like gentle, light Ari singing. And I'm like, girl! She's scared to be on the song. It, it made no sense. But yeah, so all of 2020, she was just on the radio, was stuck with you, with Rain On Me, and with Good As Hell remix. And then right after she dropped Positions... She was on the Save Your Tears remix that went number one and is like still, as we speak, massive in the U.S. So I get why everyone was kind of sick of her at this point. I will say positions might be, I'd have to think more about it to definitively say, but it's probably one of my favorite lead off singles from her. Or one of my favorite singles from her in in general. Interesting. Did you like it straight away? I did like it straight away. Which, actually, that's funny you mention that because I remember people didn't. I thought the production was great. The strings were phenomenal. It's in, like, D minor or F major, which automatically means that it's a good song. (laughs) It it was just like, it it worked for me. And I was surprised to find that a lot of people didn't feel that way. I will say, though, that made me excited for the album, and I wasn't huge on the album, largely because it actually reminded me of Justin Bieber's changes, because it was very much like about romantic bliss and kind of being happy with the person that you're with, which is great, and after everything Ariana's gone through, hell yeah, much deserved. But also, when it comes to changes, I really didn't like that album. I thought it was boring. I thought it was very, very boring. I will say, revisiting it, I've turned around a lot on the production because I would say probably as a full thing, this is her best produced album. The strings on this are phenomenal. They're just all around phenomenal. And I think it fits the mood of the album well, that the, you know, the romantic bliss aspect of it. At a certain point, it start, lyrically and thematically, it starts feeling a bit one note to me, even though sonically it is beautiful. And I think it has a lot of musical highlights to it. Yeah, no, I I get what you mean. I liked the album enough on first listen where I was like, this will grow on me and I'll like it eventually. And now I love it. But when I first heard Positions, the song, I kind of have a similar reaction to everyone else where I was kind of like, why is this a lead single? This is fine. Yeah, this is fine with the flames in the background. Tommy Brown mostly does like he's mostly responsible for the album tracks. And the fact that this was like a lead single, I guess people were just kind of like engineered to think of it as like, an album track and not like a single i don't know but what really made me love the song positions is when i listened to a slowed and reverb that was linked on like pop heads 
And I was like, oh my God, this is so much better. So I actually had to take it out of that key for me to like it. (laughs) Actually, POV was the one that stood out to me immediately. That was my favorite song immediately off the album. Great closer too. It's like vocally her best maybe. And you know, the one that I neglected my first listen through and now I love is My Hair. I think that that's a real grower. If you didn't like that song when it first came out, go back and listen to it because I mean, just this whole album is kind of a grower. Yeah, it's a matter of expectations too i mean especially since ariana had done sweetener and thank you next i think there's at that point like you know there was just ex- expectations for her whenever she would be dropping a major project like that and it's definitely i don't know if i'd call it like a left turn like a full left turn necessarily because it you know it still sounds like an ariana grande album and you know there's nothing like truly like avant-garde or anything out there but there is definitely a more muted nature to a lot of it yeah like it it lends itself to that kind of grower status not that there's more intricacies but it's not like there aren't necessarily the same kind of hooks on most of the songs that you would find on a my everything or a sweetener or anything like that it's the first time where it really feels like ariana grande made an album even though I would say Sweetener was the first time where, you know, she actually did make an album. People don't like this album because it's boring, but I think it's less notable. It's less flashy, but it's like she really fleshed out some of the best parts of her debut. You know, like this is like Honeymoon Avenue if it was a whole album. And I love that personally. I don't think it's lower in quality. I just think it's less notable. And it's still like way more successful than I think her first three albums in terms of sales. Another underrated cut, Off the Table with the Weekend. I've I've really come around to loving that song. Interesting. It's my least favorite song. Is it really? Wow. Yes. That's the one where I'm like, oh, yawn. Damn. But but again, (laughs) this album also suffers from terrible track listing. I reordered this album, too, and put Off the Table last instead of fifth. It felt really weird having it in the middle of the album. I thought that was ridiculous i think in general too i don't know if this album needed to be as long as it was it's like because the full track list is like what 14 15 songs cut it down to maybe like 10 and i think i'd have a much more like immediately positive impression of it but instead she bumped it up with the deluxe to 19 so oh yeah even though all the deluxe tracks even though they're like a minute and a half long they're so good i gotta say they definitely increase the value of the album also I have mixed feelings about 3435. Like, I'm on and off with it. I don't like how in that song she sings, like, means I want a 69 with you. And it's like, Ariana, I got what you meant. You didn't have to say it. Yeah. And then at the end, she yeah. goes, math class, which I think is cute. <laughs> oh, that, that is funny. Yeah. So let's move on to the final segment of our show. This is the top five, where we list our top five of a certain category. And today's episode, we thought, why not? do our top five Ariana Grande albums because we've already done our top five Ariana Grande songs. (laughs) This includes her Christmas EPs and her live album. So my number five, some of you might guess from how I spoke about it is Thank You Next. My number four is My Everything. My number three after revisiting it is Positions. I just think there are so many really well produced songs especially in the vocal production my number two is dangerous woman it just really solidified me as an ariana grande fan and my number one is sweetener can we just get an amen for god is a woman amen i'm just saying a woman a woman as upsaw would say yeah (laughs) all right aj it's your turn um uh okay so i already resent you so much for stealing most of it my number five is (laughs) thank you next my number four is christmas and chill i love that ep (laughs) my number three is positions my number two is dangerous woman because it has the best pop songs of her entire career all packed into one album yes please <laughs> and it doesn't stand on its legs just as much as Sweetener does, which is my number one. <laughs> I really enjoy everything about the Max Martin side to it, to the Tommy Brown side to it, to the Pharrell side to it. I just thought it was really innovative and unexpected. And that's my top five. Nice. Oh my God. AJ, how embarrassing. We got caught wearing the same top five. Someone has to go home and change. <laughs> I know. <laughs> The snare comma Mike, what is your top five? (laughs) Okay, number five, I'll do thank you next. Actually, (laughs) can I do ties? Can I do ties? Sure, go ahead. 
For number five, I'll tie Thank You Next with My Everything, because I think Thank You Next is the more cohesive project, but I also feel like I'd be doing a disservice mm. to like Love Me Harder and Break Free right? if I didn't put it on there somewhere. It's like a matter of like okay. the singles are better, but like the, the cohesion is there. Put them in the same spot. That'll be fine. I agree. Number four, K Bye For Now, the live album. Yes. Yeah, I think it's a really good representation of the albums that came before it along with some very like interesting weird diversions like i was listening this morning to um was it the call me call her or the, the, the song with daddy it's not call her daddy that's that a, is podcast. a podcast yeah <laughs> my heart belongs to daddy it's like an old jazz standard that she sings wrenched in auto tune interesting little experiments but also just like the bops are there and the performances of like god is a woman and successful and breathing are all great so and breathing is way better than the original we all agree okay yeah, anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's number four number three is positions oh my god do we all have the same top five with just this four replaced <laughs> well no, no 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 hear me out though because my number two and my number one are gonna blow people away oh my god i'm ready for christmas kisses number one i'm ready number two is dangerous woman and number one is sweetener <laughs> oh my god perfect <laughs> great minds think alike what can i say i mean dangerous woman has greedy so it's true i don't think i need to say anything else beyond that there we go and then sweetener just has i think it has the best songs and the best singles and even the songs that i don't necessarily click with i think can be very weird and i respect that about the album even if there are things that I don't necessarily vibe with totally, it's like, I like what you were going for here. And I respect the hell out yeah, of it. Yeah, just say the title track. It's okay. Flip it. Flip it. Flip it. Flip it. Better say, oh. I'm like, what, what are you doing? I do not perceive that song. <laughs> I am asleep. Thank you so much for joining us for so motherfucking yeah, of course. long. I cannot believe. Every time we record with you, it just goes on for days. And I think it's because we all have a lot to say and i appreciate you bringing oh, so much to the table so thank you so much thank for joining you. us thank you for having me and letting me be able to bring things to the table it's it's always a blast but if people want to uh love you lurk you check out what you do on youtube where can they find you even though i'm pretty sure most pop has probably already know where to find you i am mike the snare on the internet i have the youtube channel where i talk about music and things like that and it's m-i-c not m-i-k-e m-i-c mike the snare all one word on twitter instagram Instagram and TikTok. I am on TikTok. I am not an old man. Oh, I'm going to follow you on TikTok. Thank you. It's fun so far. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out like the balance of like being on there without feeling like I'm a slave to it. AJ, if people want to love you, lurk you, where can they find you? Love me, lurk me. If you want to search me, you can find me at AJ Marks Official, right? <gasps> kind of like some Kim Possible shit. Anyway. Oh my God. <laughs> oh yeah you can find me at aj marks official i have songs out as my name aj marks on spotify you can check those out too if you want because i mean others have others have listened to them i can confirm you have an ep i do there are songs on there bold an ep with songs on it who would have thought a revolutionary i got the idea from christmas and chill <laughs> I'm not saying it's bold, but I'm also not saying that it's... That it's regular <laughs> font. <laughs> anyway, so where shall people find you on the internet, Sola? I am at I am Sola Music on all platforms, including a, a TikTok that I've also just started and I'm figuring out. Too many platforms, one might argue. Yes, this is true. Um, I have a song out called Thin Line, which is just one word because no one ever told me that it's two words and you can listen to that. <laughs> Wait, no one told you that thin was its own word? No. Oh, okay. I live in a thick girl world, so it's just, yeah. <laughs> and if you like this episode, please give us a follow on all of our Popheads platforms. That is at Popheads Reddit on Instagram, right? At Popheads on Twitter, yeah. at Popheads Reddit on TikTok, I'm pretty sure, and then r slash Popheads on Reddit itself. And also, we have merch um, available on T Public, where you can find the link in the description below. <laughs> also, thank you so much, Nick, for making the episode artwork. As always, you are the bomb. 